Good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Your next presenter is one of us. His name is Patrick Hall, as you can see up there. I met Patrick quite a number of years ago when he'd been uh, working in an organisation that was using the Vanguard method that was then taken over by a whole bunch of people who uh, insisted on t in turning it back into the wrong kind of place. And basically we had a conversation where Patrick said, uh, I'm either going to work with Vanguard or I'm going to be a postman. So I'm very pleased he's not a postman. Uh, Patrick's going to take you through... Uh, <coughs> Some work that reflects on the, uh, the history of industrialization and the logic and kind of what's gone wrong. Uh, and he's going to give a client example. Uh, but also, en route, he's going to outline for you some of the essential steps uh, in study and redesign in the Vanguard method. So please welcome Patrick Hall. Thank you, John. Um, I only want to be a postman because I've got a black and white cat. <laughs> and my name's Pat, obviously. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I'm going to uh, talk to you today about something that's interested, uh, intrigued me, and puzzled me for a number of years. Um, my background is in banking, so we're going to do banking again straight after lunch. Woohoo! Interesting and exciting and very sexy, not. But what, what I'm going to talk through. Okay, it's going to be related to what I've learnt over a longer period of time, but I think every time that I've done this presentation, and I've done it with a group of solicitors or housing association people or some utilities, public sector, it, it seems to ring true. So it's designed around what I've learnt, but hopefully you're going to be able to apply it to what you do as well. So I'm going to structure it around something... Uh, it's a, a key relationship to the Vanguard method, and it's called thinking system performance. And for those of you who have worked with us before, you'll know all about this. Um, some of you who haven't worked with us before, it's going gonna, it's gonna to touch on the Vanguard method. And as I build this relationship, then I'm going to try and uh, describe some of the things that we go through when we apply the Vanguard method. As organisations, I'm assuming that you're coming from the point that you want to improve performance. And certainly when we work with organisations, what we want to do is improve performance. So for me, when I'm looking at performance, I'm thinking about service, what we're here to do from a customer's point of view. We're looking to hopefully improve efficiency. And for me, efficiency means, I guess, how much effort goes in to getting what people want, how much effort do the customers need to put in, how much effort does an organisation need to put in. One of the first things that we'll talk about uh, when we talk to senior leaders about what does performance mean, then predictably, they'll talk about costs and revenue. And then, of course, morale. Uh, not the first thing always in people's minds, but it's amazing how we apply this Vanguard method. We never set out to improve morale, but we get these bunch of people who are saying, this is really good, why didn't we do this in the first place? So we're trying to improve performance. We understand that the key lever to improve performance is in the end-to-end -end system or the way that we design and manage work. So when we're talking about what is the Vanguard method, part of the Vanguard method will be we need to understand what's going on in the system, what's happening in the design and management of work. And we'll use a framework to try to understand that. So we'll talk about customer's perspective, what's your purpose? We need to go and study demand. You've heard a lot about this already, but this is just trying to outline what the Vanguard method is. So when we go to study demand, what are we learning? What are the types and frequencies of demand that are coming in? How often do we get these? Are they value demand? Are they failure demand? And what matters from a customer's point of view? Because if we can get there, if we can understand why we're here and what customers want us to do, then we're able to put some sensible measures around understanding how good the system is at responding to what the customers want. That kind of naturally takes us into the flow of the work. How long is it taking and why and how much waste have we got? And you get a general picture then as to what the system looks like. And then we start thinking, well, why does it look that way? What's in the system to make that happen? So we're constantly trying to understand the design and management of work. What sits across the design and management of work is the way that we think. So we'll constantly go back to, well, if it looks like that, why is that? What's in our mind to make that happen? With a view to, 
If we can understand the performance, and we can go and study the um, design and management of work, and it's making us get to a point of that's happening because we think this way, if we can change the way that we think, then what we'll be able to do is design work differently, and we'll get a different level of performance. And part of what I'm going to do today is talk about different designs and management of work, and what the thinking was behind that. And I'm going to do it from quite a personal journey. So, that's me. Obviously, a lot younger in those days, better looking as well, thinner. I worked for an organisation called the Leeds Permanent Building Society. Uh, I don't know if anybody remember the Leeds perm? Rahi. Some of us still in the crowd, that's great. And, and I started working there in 1992. And my first job was to be a cashier. So customers would come in and say, £10 in, £20 out. Um, can you update my passbook, please? Remembering passbooks, building societies and passbooks. It was good days, wasn't it? Fantastic. So I, I kind of learned how to do that. It took me longer than it should have done, but I was able to do that. And um, after a fashion, I then was asked to do things like open accounts. They were really letting me loose. You know, I could open liquid gold accounts and solid gold accounts. And then my next stage was learning how to do personal loans. Um, and as the months ticked by, I started doing things like secured personal loans. And after about, I guess it was 12 to 18 months, I became what was called a home arranger. Remember home arrangers? They're laughing all the way to the leads with a home arranger. Now, a home arranger these days is called a mortgage advisor, which is kind of interesting because when I was a home arranger, I did actually look after people into their new home. We used to do things like uh, work out what your new telephone number was. So as you moved into your new home, we would have connected you up to the gas and the electric and we would have given you your new telephone number. It was a bit of a mindset around, we need to look after these customers and help them because they're moving home. It's not necessarily about a transactional mortgage. So there I was, back in 92, back in the day, um, understanding that some customers might come to me. I'd be able to do whatever happens next. So £10 in, that's great. I want to do a personal loan, that's fine. Up goes my position closed, take them into a little interview room, um, do what we do, and somebody would come from the admin team back up if there was a queue. And it, it began dawning on me that I was able to do most of the things that the customers asked me to do. From time to time, somebody would come in, and I used to panic when this would happen. It would be, I, I can see the interest on my solid gold account from three years ago, but I don't understand how it's been arrived at. And I'm thinking, hmm, I failed GCSE maths, I can't, can't be doing this. So I used to be able to phone these people up in Leeds, and they were called saving services. And similarly, if it was a mortgage query, when we used to do things like Myras, then I would be able to phone lending services. And what intrigued me about this was that every time I phoned saving services, I always spoke to Dot, or I always spoke to Joan, thinking, OK, so we've got about 700 branches in the Leeds, but there's a group of people who sit on, <laughs> it must have been about six or seven people all sat on a bank of desks who were able to deal with all of our queries because we're able to do a lot of the stuff at the front line, and exactly the same situation with lending services as well. So I understand I'm painting a very nostalgic picture, and perhaps it's just taking me back to my younger days. I don't know, but things seem to be, things seem to be okay. And I'll try and paint a picture around a, a typical demand. So regularly, we'd have people who would come in and say, I need to borrow some uh, more money because uh, we're thinking about getting a new kitchen. And we'd sit them down and say, OK, Mr. Jones, let me have a look at your account. I can see that you've been with us for 15 years. You've never missed a mortgage payment. There's plenty of equity in your property. I'm going to put it through a credit scoring system. Credit scoring system says, yes, how would you like the money? Do you want it today? Or would you like it when the builder starts? Or would you like it at the end? As long as you understand that you're paying interest from the time we give you the money, then we're OK. So we would get these types of transactions, and they would, that would typically last 20 or 25 minutes. The other interesting thing was that if you put it through the credit scoring system, it was either tick, cross, or grey area. And the grey area was then down to me to make a decision over. And it, it dawned on me that we were being driven um, by a set of principles rather than a set of rules. So when I was working in the Leeds, we had this overriding uh, banner, if you like. It was, it was more than corporate wallpaper. 
But I was trained in customer first. And what that meant to me was that my role was to try to answer as many queries for the customer as I could at the first point of contact. I was then being paid a salary, so it was down to me to do sensible things. And I was asked to, if you're going to make a decision, then think about risk. So if it's a risk to the customer, or if it's a risk to me personally, or if it's a risk to the organization, don't do it. And it was described to me as, as you're driving, if you're coming up to a set of traffic lights, you know when it kind of is amber and you're thinking, mm, <laughs> I might go through with this one, and sometimes I do, I admit that, just as it's going amber to red, I was told if that's in your mind, then that's, that's when you don't lend. So there was a, a set of principles uh, around what I was doing in there. But as I say, that, that typical example was 20 to 25 minutes. So when I think about performance levels, so we talked about service efficiency, revenue, and morale. From a service perspective, customers would come in, and largely, they would get what they wanted. It was interesting in so much as way back then, there was um, branches, but no internet banking, no telephone banking. So we were kind of restricting customers from an opening hour perspective, but generally, service was pretty good. Efficiency, how much effort was going in from a customer's side, how much effort was going in for ours. Efficiency was pretty good. Costs and revenue. Now, again, very, very different because the whole measurement side of things was totally different to what you'd see now in banking. There was one measure that I was aware of, and it was across the whole of the organization. So when I first joined, somebody talked to me about the cost-income ratio, which is basically, for every pound we make, how much does it cost us? And at that time, cost-income ratio in the Leeds perm was hovering around the 40p mark. And we were trying to understand, what, if we did things differently, were we able to reduce that? And then uh, up until 1994, we continued to reduce that, and we got to a stage where it was 38.6p. Don't ask me how I remember this stuff, but it kind of stuck in my mind. Maybe it was because it was the only measure. So we were running at about 38.5p as far as the cost-income ratio was concerned. But it was measurable. Morale, well, hoping that you're able to understand, that I thought was bloody great. Not, not once did I feel the need to go into work with a Hawaiian shirt on. <laughs> or, you know, when it came round to the World Cup time, I never needed to dress as Morocco while John needed to dress as Portugal or anything like that. We, we were there to solve problems from a customer's point of view. And it felt good. I really, really enjoyed it. And I suppose if you're trying to measure that, I, I was in that organisation for three years, and I don't know one person who left. So you could probably put some, some measures around that. So, yeah, it was good. And of course, that's way back in 92. So surely things have improved since then. 